Welcome back. We've gotten to the point where we can talk about the longitudinal and cross-sectional shape of columns and how those uh, either strengthen or weaken our, uh, our uh, structural elements. We'll talk in this video about uh, a couple of mathematical quantities, the radius of gyration and the slenderness ratio of columns, and then we'll look at the connections, how the way that we fix columns to girders and to foundations can actually help us trick the column into thinking that it's shorter than it actually is. And remember that structurally this is what we want. Uh, columns that are shaped like hockey pucks work more like uh, axially loaded members. The longer and skinnier the column gets, the more we have to worry about buckling. To start with, let's think about the cross-sectional shape of columns. We had this figure section modulus that we worked with in beam design that gave us a way to understand how the area of a beam and where that area was located in relation to the beam's neutral axis could help to resist the internal moment stresses that built up in a, in a bending member. The thing that makes beam design a little bit simpler than column design in some ways is that we always know which direction the load is going. We always know how to design the beam against bending. And so even though we pointed out that beams have section moduli in both their uh, X and Y axes. We never used the section modulus for the weak axis, the, the, uh, the section modulus about the Y axis. It was usually much, much lower. We didn't really uh, have any use for it. We were looking for the way to make the beam as strong as we possibly could. Well, with columns, we have a slightly different issue because we know they're being loaded axially, but we don't really know which way they're going to buckle. And so what we have to do is we have to come up with a way to think about how to make the column strong in every direction. So we're interested uh, in where the area of the cross section is. We're not so interested in how we build up bending moment. We know we're gonna do that. We're more interested in thinking about designing columns to a, a, a given slenderness ratio. In other words, taking the average width of the column and dividing it by the length and using that along with some empirical uh, knowledge to figure out what a safe uh, load is for that shape of column, right? That shape of column and that slenderness ratio. So we use this uh, figure in mathematics known as the radius of gyration uh, R. And what this is, is basically uh, the equivalent uh, cylinder shape for any given cross section. And the way we find it is we take the shaped moment of inertia, we divide out the area, and then we take the square root of that. And we get a figure R that is basically the, the effective radius of that shape. For a circular shape, R equals the radius of the shape. Nothing really complex about that. But if we're using W shapes or uh, angles or squares or anything that isn't a perfect circle, this is a way of telling us what the equivalent circular section would be. So shapes moment of inertia, I shapes area A, and that tells us the basic uh, average radius, the distance from each fiber on average to the shape's uh, centroid. And just to compare with section modulus and section modulus, we're finding uh, a similar figure, but we're multiplying that by the quantity of area to come up with a, a, a resistant moment. So R radius is just a geometric principle, uh, property. It doesn't tell us about the column's strength against bending or buckling, but what it does is it tells us basically how to assess the column's width, right? And that helps with its resistance to buckling. The, the greater the proportion of width to length, the, strong, the, the stronger the shape is going to be. Now, unlike uh, beam design, like I said, we don't know which direction the beam is going to buckle. And so when we're finding a radius of gyration, we're finding it about one axis or the other, either the X or Y axis. That's similar to section modulus. But when we're looking at section modulus, we're trying to find the strongest possible dimension because we know which way we're gonna orient the beam. The problem is that in column design, we don't know. And so if we choose a column shape like the one here on the right, column three, that's a great beam design because it's got a lot of depth, it's concentrated its cross-sectional area in the flanges, far away from the neutral axis here. 
The problem is that if it begins to buckle around the y-axis in the direction of the x-axis, we know that we have a comparatively weak shape. All of that material in the flanges is actually bunched up pretty close to the vertical axis, which is what it's going to be buckling around. And this, even though it's a strong beam shape, is actually a really terrible column shape. As we get to more what we call compact sections, the radius of gyration in both axes is going to start to come closer and closer. And we'll find that, for instance, column two does still have a weak axis. It's going to be weaker around the y-axis than the x-axis, but it's going to have some resistance in both directions. It's not going to be uh, quite as lopsided as the case of column three. And if we have a perfectly round shape, notice that that circle has no weak axis. It has the same radius of gyration, in this case the same radius, in every axis. So no matter what direction the column begins to buckle in, that shape is going to be equally resistant to it. Right? It's not going to have this imbalance where one axis is very, very strong and one axis is very, very weak. When we're looking at column design, we're always looking for the worst case, the least radius of gyration. That's what we'll call the effective uh, width of the column. So if we have uh, a, a very, very deep W shape, we have to be looking at the radius of gyration, not around the x-axis where it's strong, but around the y-axis where it's weak. And the radius of gyration for a circular tube shape is going to be the same in every direction. There is no weak axis uh, in, a, in a circle. Now, we can find these for rectangular shapes, but again, in the steel tables especially, uh, they'll be given to us for every W shape, for every angle, for every bar. Uh, we'll get R along with all the other geometric properties that we're now used to. Moment of inertia, section modulus, centroid down here, and here, radius of gyration. Now, one fine point. You may be looking at the radius of gyration for a circle and saying, oh, it's the diameter over 4, and shouldn't it actually be diameter over 2? That's what the actual radius of the circle is. But the radius of gyration is telling us the average distance for every fiber in that circle from its center point. So what it's really taking is not the dimension to the outer circumference of that circular section, but it's saying, oh, when we go from the center to that outer circumference, we have fibers, in this case, throughout the section, right? It's a solid bar. And so the average radius is going to be right in the middle of the total radius, right? The largest radius. So not only do we want to have circular sections, but we actually want to have hollow tubes so that we're pushing the average fiber uh, position out as far away from the center as possible. So what are good column shapes? Well, good column shapes are not rectangular bars unless we are fixing a girder to it and we know that the, the moment imparted by that girder is going to be in a, in a given direction. If we're just axially loading a shape, then we definitely don't want something that's asymmetrical. We don't want a bar. We don't want a typical beam shape. A compact solid shape is good, but all of that area near the center actually means that the effective radius is getting pulled closer and closer, right? So it's working like a shape, a hollow shape, that's about half the size. If we start to fine tune it, we can come up, for instance, with uh, cross shapes. Think of Mies van der Rohe's cross-shaped uh, columns. These are good because they have two strong axes uh, and, and relatively uh, uh, efficient area. But notice that we're collecting the area kind of around the two axes. So it's, uh, uh, the, the, it's a compact shape, but the area is actually located closer to the neutral axes than, than we might like. The best column shapes are hollow tubes. Hollow squares, or the theoretical idea, is a hollow circle. And a hollow circle, of course, if we think about it being infinitely thin, then the radius of gyration will just be the radius. Uh, for a square, notice that we've got to actually calculate it because we have uh, corners, but we're not going to have a, a weak axis in, in either direction. It's going to perform the same. So rotationally symmetrical is best and hollow sections are best. And the ideal column shape is in fact a hollow circle where we have no weak axis and we've pushed all the material all the way out to the, to the edges of the, of the shape.
Now, we can look at uh, some uh, kind of experimental shapes and see how this works. So if we have just a regular rectangular section, in uh, one direction we have a relatively good uh, radius of gyration, uh, four inches or so uh, here, if we've got a, a depth of 14 inches and a width of 1.75. Um, but notice that it's going to buckle in the weak direction, right? So we have about 10 times the strength in one direction as the other. Or, think about it another way, we're only really getting one-tenth of the potential column performance out of a thin bar. For roughly the same area, if we go with an I-beam, then notice that we get better R's in both directions, and now we have a ratio of like 2 to 1. So because we put the flanges out here at the edges, we have a very, very strong column in one direction and a, a weaker but slightly better version than this, a weaker column in this other direction. We use I-beams for columns all the time, not because they're the best shape, but because they're easy to attach things to. Right? We have plenty of space to frame beams into the web, which we know is best. We're not putting an eccentric load on and also into the flanges. If we're putting beams on both flanges, then we're balancing those eccentric loads out. Now, what happens if we rotate the section? Right? What happens if we say, well, okay, one way to make sure there isn't a weak axis is just to make it the same in both directions. And here we're doubling the area, of course, um, but we're equaling the radius of gyration in both directions. So note that adding a second I-beam shape actually reduces our strongest case because we're piling up material closer to the, um, to the in, in this case, closer to the y-axis, but we're balancing things out. So we no longer have a weak axis. The, the problem, of course, is that we've doubled the amount of steel. We've doubled the weight, therefore we've doubled the cost. Now, in the 1890s, engineers got around this with a very clever shape called a gray column that had four T's, actually eight angles, that were connected by occasional intermittent diagonals. And you can see that this approaches the radius of gyration of that rotated uh, beam section, but again gives us an area that is roughly the same as our single I-beam section by taking out basically the flanges in the middle and concentrating the material out at the edges. Two directions, more or less rotationally symmetrical, uh, relatively high radius of gyration in both cases, uh, and an economical use of area. Now, just to complete the exercise, right, what happens if we take that 24 square inches and literally push it all the way out to the perimeter? Well, you can see that for a square uh, and for a circle, we get very good radius of gyration. And in fact, a square is uh, a little bit stronger in the X and Y axis. The advantage to the circle is that it is strong in every conceivable uh, axis. Slightly lower R around X and Y. Uh, but better in kind of uh, intermediate uh, rotate, rotated axes. So why don't we always use these? Well, it gets back to this problem of construction. We don't have a good way to get inside and bolt things to a hollow section. To do that, we need to weld tabs and things onto the outside. It can be unsightly, it can be a little bit difficult. There are constructional reasons that we stick with I-beams, and we use what are called compact sections. Uh, when we use I-beams for columns. These are theoretical ideas. Architecturally, we sometimes like to see hollow tubes used as columns because that's kind of what our intuition uh, expects. But constructionally, we'll very often take the hit that comes with using an I-beam, the slightly lower radius of gyration. We'll just be careful about the sections that we pick. And like I said, we'll pick compact sections that behave a little bit better than some of those really, really deep, uh, deep W shapes. Now, through history, I think builders have actually known that buckling is an issue and that the way to address buckling is to make rotationally uh, symmetrical shapes. You can go back to ancient Greece where they used round solid columns. Uh, you can also look at Gothic architecture and see the piping that typically exists on the side of the piers, almost like kind of outrigger columns that give uh, those piers a little bit more radius of gyration in the X and Y direction. Right, that move some of that material out away from the solid center uh, and, and extend the, the edges a little bit. Um, I don't know for a fact that Gothic masons thought this. Certainly easier to add little bits and bobs around the outside than to go in and try to hollow the stone pier out. Visually, I think these give us exactly what we expect to see in a column. In other words, that it's braced 
not making it uh, necessarily stronger, tapering as it goes down, uh, but actually adding those outriggers that help to keep the column from buckling, right? That make it a good beam in every direction. So once we've figured out a col uh, column's radius of gyration, it's kind of average width, we can use this to establish what we call its slenderness ratio. And this is really the key to column design. We can't go in and design it as a beam in an infinite number of directions, but what we can do is we can use some empirical data to understand where we start to get into buckling danger, what ratio of height to average width we get, we get into trouble in. And we have three basic ways that we design columns. When we are uh, at a, a span to, or sorry, a height to width ratio under 50, I'll get to what K is here in a little bit, um, when we're under 50, this is called a short column, or as we've been referring to them, hockey pucks, right? Relatively stout column that if it's going to fail, it's going to fail in compression. Uh, it's not long enough, not tall enough, slender enough uh, to buckle. On the other end of the spectrum, if we have a length to width ratio of over 200, then we're into what we call long columns. Um, these we have a real risk of buckling and we may have to do things like add material uh, to a W shape or brace its length uh, to keep it from, uh, from actually buckling, right? Going into a bending, uh, getting out of the way of the load. Usually we are trying to design in the intermediate range between a ratio of 1 to 50 and a ratio of 1 to 200. And we will pick our columns based on the load that we know that we're putting on them and the slenderness ratio. We'll check it very often for axial performance, right, to make sure that it can handle the load without crushing, but more often we'll go to the charts and we will use the slenderness ratio and the load that we're putting onto it to figure out whether we're in, we're in safe territory or not. And that is not necessarily a theoretically calculated figure. That, like I said, is an empirically derived figure. These ratios have worked with these loads for a century or more, we know that they're, uh, that they're safe. Now, we can make columns that are longer than the slenderness ratio. We have good examples of that right nearby us on campus. Um, as long as, like those radio towers that we talked about when we looked at Salvadori's mile high column, we are bracing them in both the X and Y direction. So the water tower here, you can see all of these uh, lattice girders that are horizontal are clearly not picking up any of the tower's vertical load. What they're doing is they're bracing each one of the legs on the outside. They're preventing it from buckling either by moving in or out or by moving circumferentially, right, uh, right to left as we go around. And notice that we've got lattice girders that uh, balance out this one against this one tied around the, the standpipe in the middle. And we also have lattice girders that balance this against that one. So if you think about it, if this one starts to try to buckle, it's going to transfer its load to this one, which is going to try to buckle and transfer its load to this one all the way around. We end up basically with a giant compression ring where the, uh, the rest of the columns actually stabilize the one that, that's trying to buckle. Now, we can fix uh, columns periodically throughout their length to shorten their unbraced length. But we can also do things to their connections at the top and bottom to kind of trick them into thinking that they're shorter than they actually are, right? adjusting the length uh, to make that slenderness ratio uh, work for us a little bit harder. How do we do this? Well, here we have to go back and think about connections. Remember with beam design, we talked about pin connections being important for the calculation process. We needed a way to kind of fuse at the ends of the beams to make sure that moment wasn't being transferred from the beam into the foundations, right? This was the way that we were able to establish beam equilibrium using just simple algebra. I mentioned briefly that if we did have moment connections, we would have to use some more sophisticated calculus-based methods to figure out how the moment transferred. Well, anytime we have a tougher calculation, it often means that we've got a more efficient structure, and this is no exception. When we fix a column to a girder with a pin, we're allowing that column a full range of motion. And so we're not giving it any resistance to buckling at all, right? It's gonna buckle on its own just as, as any column uh, its whole length would be. 
But if we grab the end of that column and prevent it from rotating, think about what's happening right at that connection. When that column wants to buckle, instead of being free to rotate around the connection, it still has to come out of a fixed connection at a 90 degree angle, and it's only going to be able to buckle or bend by actually twisting itself, right? deflecting itself. So if you see the shape here where a column is fixed on both ends, you can see that it has a three different points of inflection as we go along it. It starts to curve to the left here. So there's an inflection point that starts right at the, uh, the, the, the base connection. There's an inflection point here where it changes curvature, stops going left and starts going right. And then there's another inflection point at the connection on the top. So those two connections are making the column come out basically at 90 degrees. And if the column is gonna bend, it's gonna have to bend itself, right? It's gonna have to actually uh, distort its own material uh, to go through this buckling process. If we have a column that's pinned at both ends, note that there's only one inflection point and the column being free to rotate here doesn't have any work to do to move or to get out of the way. What we've basically done is we've made the column feel shorter. Um, if you look at where it begins to really diverge from the vertical here, you can see that we've got a length that theoretically we think of as being half the, the distance. But in reality, that curvature now we assume is about two thirds of the actual length. So here's the full curvature, one time the actual length, and if you look here, the amount of curvature here is only about two thirds of it. This is the, the principle of what we call the K factor. We can multiply the, uh, the effective uh, length of a column by this factor, depending on how stiff the connections are and gain some uh, length or actually lose some length, make the column perform like a shorter column. Notice that if we fix both ends, heavy connections, moment connections that are stiff and solid at both the top connection and the foundation, that column is gonna perform like a column that's only two thirds as long. So we're gonna have a much lower slenderness ratio than if we have a column that's merely pinned on both ends. And what we'll do is when we're looking at the slenderness ratio, the L over R, we'll come to this chart and we'll look at these numbers down here and we will multiply the slenderness ratio by these numbers to get a practical slenderness ratio, what the column is actually going to do. If it's pinned at both ends, we get no credit. That is gonna bend just like a column, just like every other column its whole length. If we fix one end and pin the other, we can take a 20% credit. Right? The column's gonna perform like a column, a pinned column that's only 80% of its length. Fixed on both ends, like I said, two thirds. And then notice that if we allow the column to move at one end or the other, we actually take a penalty. Right? These columns are going to perform like columns that are longer than ours, that have a much greater slenderness ratio, and therefore are more liable to buckle. So, for example, if you think about Salvadori's tall column, right, that mile-high column, if it's fixed at the base and we're not stabilizing it in any way, the column's free to move around at the top, is actually going to perform like a column two miles tall that was fixed. And then finally, uh, pinned at one end, slider uh, on the other. In other words, if we have a fix but allow it to move, that column is also going to be about a performable like one that's about twice as tall. Almost all of the uh, architectural situations we'll be in are down at this end, right? We're usually finding ways to actually take a credit, to make the column feel like a column uh, that's much shorter than it actually is. And here, a little demonstration where uh, you can see the difference we have pin connections here and here, uh, fixed connections here, here, and here. Sorry, pin connection over here too. And you can see the shape, right? That triple wave, if we're fixed at both places, uh, you can see that the column is getting out of the way much less, about 25 millimeters as opposed to 40 millimeters. And you can see too that the curvature really feels like it takes a while to get going, right? And that is why we can take uh, this credit for a fixed and fixed connection. Notice here we have no connection down at the base and that thing of course is moving all over the place, right? A, a much greater deflection uh, than with our pinned and pinned or our fixed and fixed. 
So the empirical evidence that we've collected uh, means that we have a lot of tried and true evidence for how columns buckle. And because this is much simpler than going in and trying to do all of the very detailed kind of um, calculations we'd need to, to figure out um, how a column is going to behave like a beam and a, and a column all at the same time. We have all of these tables that let us just take a couple of uh, quantities from our situation, plug them into a, a table, uh, and figure out what a safe load is for on, on or what a safe column shape is for a given combination of load and length. We need to know three things. We need to know the load that we're going to put on the column. So we'll go through our tributary area calculations. We need to know the column length, the actual length of the column. And then we need to know the end conditions. And we need to go back to that chart and find the modifier for whether they're pinned or fixed uh, at both ends. We then go to uh, steel handbooks uh, in particular or uh, timber charts. And we can read off what safe uh, shapes are for these various conditions. This is what a column design chart looks like, a uh, little bit different than a section modulus chart because we have arranged uh, the columns going down here. These are for Douglas fir timber columns, uh, imperial four by four up to a 16 by 16. And note that all of these are pretty compact. We have some rectangular ones, but nothing that's, that's really crazy, right? All of these are relatively good uh, column sizes. And then reading to the right, notice that we have effective unsupported length, K times L. So here we go, six feet, eight feet, 10 feet. These are the like floor to floor heights that the columns are having to span. And when we find our floor to floor height, say we're in a, a commercial situation, so maybe we've got a 12 foot floor to floor height. Notice that then we have figures reading down in thousands of pounds, right? And what these tell us is the safe load for a 12 foot column that is, in this case, four by four, we can put 3,500 pounds on it safely. Uh, 16 by 16, we can put 230,000 pounds on it. So instead of having to do a lot of math, both the timber industry and the steel industry have these charts that basically say, look, we've been building timber buildings, steel buildings for more than 100 years. We can go in and we can actually tell you from experience uh, what a safe load on a 12 foot tall column and all these sizes is. Much handier, much more convenient uh, than, than, than beam design. Um, here we have a, a steel chart. Um, I'll zoom into this when we do examples. We have column sizes that are coming down here and notice that we've got a lot of different, uh, in this case, a lot of um, uh, pipe shapes, so hollow tubes. Going across to the right here, we have effective length. So the length times the K factor to uh, take into account uh, our connections top and bottom. And then reading down, we have safe allowable loads in both metric uh, and in, in imperial. So if to find a safe load, um, what we need to do, we have a column here that uh, has 130,000 pounds on it. A kip is 1,000 pounds. This is a, a way to sound like an engineer. Instead of saying 130,000 pounds, we say 130 kips. We have a 20 foot tall column. Notice that it's fixed at the base and pinned at the top. So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out what the end conditions contribute to the resistance of the column to back buckling. We need to figure out whether we can take a credit for having a fixed connection basically at the base. So fixed at the base, pinned at the top. We go to this chart and here we go right here, fixed at one end at the base, pinned at the top. Doesn't matter which end is which, the column doesn't know, but we see here that we can take that 20% credit. So instead of behaving like a 20 foot column, our column is actually going to behave like a pinned column that was 16 feet long. So we find the effective length 16 feet. So it's able to resist buckling like a 16 foot pinned column, even though it's 20 feet long, we get that 20% benefit from the fixed connection. And we know that our load on the column is 130 kips, that's P. So now we go to the column, or sorry, go to the chart, the steel chart for 836 steel. And we look for a column that supports this load at this length, 130 kips at an effective length of 16 feet. Okay, so here is an 836 column uh, blown up a little bit. 
And if we come over, we see that we have 16 feet right here. We're always going to round up. So if it ended up being 15.2 feet, we would go to 16 feet as well. And then we come down until we find something that is more than 130 kips. And here we go right here. We have 141 kips is an allowable load on a W8 by 35 column. Now, the nice part about this is that unlike beam design, we do not have to do an iteration where we take the dead weight of the column into account. Number one, the dead weight of the column is going to be pretty trivial given the, the size of a probable tributary load. Number two, it's baked in to these charts already, right? This is what a W8 by 35 can carry in addition to its own self weight. So W8 by 35 seems to be our uh, column. We go back, we look in the steel charts, and we find that the area of the W8 by 35 is 10.3. We know that the allowable strength of steel is 22,000 PSI, and we can also run to check to make sure that, our, uh, that it won't fail in compression. The charts tell us it won't fail in buckling. We always double check to see that it won't fail in compression. We're not designing a short column here. We're designing an intermediate column. And in fact, we have something like 1.4 times the amount of capacity uh, as load we're putting on it. We're putting 130,000 pounds putting up, put on it, and a W8 by 35 can carry 226,600 pounds. So we're good. In the next video, we'll go through a slightly more detailed example where we will look at tributary area and we will design columns for a multi-story building. In other words, taking each tributary uh, or taking each floor, looking at what each column is carrying, both its own floor and the floors above it, sizing columns for those various conditions and looking in particular at what happens when we do a very typical architectural thing of having uh, a taller lobby floor than uh, upper floor.